didn't realize we had advertised this starting at 6.30, so thank you all for being here. Sorry, waiting started a little late this time. My name is Colleen. I lead all of the programming for the Battery. It's my pleasure to host you all here in our new parlor that we just reopened. Um, thanks. It's been so exciting to see all the changes come to fruition that we've been working on over the past 18 months while we've been closed. And we're so happy to have everyone here back at the Battery um, together to experience these types of talks. So tonight we're here for national security in a post-pandemic world, a really important topic. The COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped the global political and security landscape. The United States has been forced to grapple with issues that are challenging the established global order, such as restructuring the supply chains, growing competition with China, and the rise of disinformation campaigns. Our understanding of the relationships the U.S. has with actors around the world is crucial to developing solutions to these new and emerging threats. To help build that understanding tonight, we're joined by Richard Fontaine, the CEO of the Center for the New American Security. CNAS is an independent, bipartisan, nonprofit think tank based in Washington, D.C. that focuses on developing strong, pragmatic, and principled national security and defense policies. Prior to CNAS, Mr. Fontaine served as foreign policy advisor to the McCain 2008 presidential campaign and subsequently as minority Depu deputy staff director on the Senate Armed Services Committee. While at the State Department, thank you. Yeah, there's thank more. Thank you. I'm done. I'm now done. Yeah. <laughs> Drop the mic. Yeah. <laughs> and joining Richard tonight is Rashmi Maria. Rashmi is a board leader, diversity and equity, and inclusion advisor working with local and national organizations that focus on gender equity and education. She has extensive experience working across the private, public, and political sectors and began her career in neuroscience research working for a multinational pharmaceutical in South Africa before shifting to mission-driven work. But before I turn it over to Rashmi and Richard, just a couple of housekeeping items. We are live streaming tonight and we'll share a link to the recording um, on our Battery YouTube page. And towards the end of the hour, we'll shift to audience Q&A where we'll pass around some mics. So um, Rashmi, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Colleen. Well, welcome everyone. And um, Colleen, I'm gonna depend on you to help me keep time because I forgot to wear my watch. So when we get to Q&A, just give me a signal. Richard, welcome to the Battery. It's an amazing place. And I don't know if you've been here before. I never have, but it's so cool. You might never <laughs> want to leave. Yeah, there's so many cool spaces and most importantly, the coolest people. Yeah. Um, so welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And I thought we would just get started with getting to know you a bit better. So listening to Colleen's introduction made me think you've been in national security and foreign policy for a really long time. And I'm wondering what keeps you excited about this line of work? So you're right, I am getting older. Um, uh, but uh, no, all, my entire career, I've done uh, nothing but foreign policy and national security. Um, for me, when you start thinking about these kinds of issues, about the relationships among countries, about the kind of threats that our nation faces, about the kind of opportunities around the world, the things that are shaping the world that is coming, it's sort of hard to stop thinking about those things. And uh, they're both inherently fascinating, and I think they're important. Um, and, uh, you know, for all of the times when uh, the United States uh, gets things wrong, gets things right, uh, you know, the consequences of those are, are pretty significant. So uh, I'm privileged now to run this think tank, the Center for New American Security in Washington, and uh, we try to develop um, good ideas that we can inject into the policy process with the aim of making our national security policy a little bit better. Well, we're glad that you do this work, so thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, as we look around the world, and, you know, we're aware from the media of various hotspots around the world, but I would like to know your perspective on three hotspots that you, in particular, are keeping your eye on, and maybe they're going to be obvious to us, but maybe not. Well, the biggest one and most obvious one is China. Um, and this is really the set of issues that has animated the imaginations of most policymakers in Washington. So if you ask people in Washington right now, most of them, what they're working on, the top three answers tend to be China, China, and China. Um, so ch the US-China relationship and, and the role of China in all of its manifestations. So. You can trace that back to China's role in the pandemic. You can look at technology issues related to China. You can look at military issues and China's um, 
increasing capabilities and its projection of power into places like South China Sea or uh, challenges to Taiwan and things like that. You can look at the diplomacy. So uh, China is, a, is an obvious one, um, but I think it's far from the only one, uh, even though it gets quite uh, disproportionate attention in Washington. Uh, Russia is, uh, is the kind of uh, hot spot that if we ignore it too long, it will make itself heard. Uh, and in fact, as we're sitting here today, the U.S. is um, subject to one of, if not the biggest, uh, set of Russian cyber attacks that um, have been recorded. Um, it mostly appears to be for espionage reasons, but it's across the private sector, uh, companies, government institutions, think tanks, things like that. Um, and the Russian capabilities and their tolerance for risk, um, whether it's meddling in elections or cyber attacks or things like that, um, make it, again, uh, the kind of actor that one simply can't ignore because it will make itself heard. Um, and then third is not really uh, so much a hot spot, but I think uh, coming out of the pandemic and God willing, at some point we will, um, there are things that are different uh, about the world. There are things that, uh, you know, we will come out of, whether it's related to supply chains uh, and U.S.-China relations and uh, the perception of American power and competence and things like that. They're going to have reverberations uh, for a number of years uh, after that and trying to tease out how we um, can take best advantage of some of those trends and mitigate the problems where there are other ones, I think it's pretty important. Well, can we dig a bit deeper into China? So I know there's many different facets there, but you know, we in the United States have been a leader in technology for a very long time. And I'm just wondering if you feel like that era is gonna come to an end because the Chinese are very focused on a strategic plan to overtake us in the area of artificial intelligence. And I think they have a very focused plan with a date of 2030 that they've articulated. So I'm just wondering, where do you feel the United States stands in relation to that competitive space with China? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the United States is still on top, um, but I think the gap between the United States and China has uh, closed um, pretty considerably over the last mm, four or five, six years. You know, it was always um, kind of a cardinal truth that uh, China was good at imitating technology. It was good at making technology um, more cheaply, at having access to greater data pools given its population and its complete lack of uh, worry about privacy issues and things like that, but that it couldn't innovate, uh, that it couldn't come up with, the, with with new things on its own. And, and that assumption, I think, has gone right out the window over the past couple of years. I mean, some of the uh, Chinese advances in particular technologies um, and in particular apps and things like that are as innovative as anything around. And so uh, we can't sort of comfort ourselves either from a private sector or from a foreign policy national security perspective with thinking that, well, you know, they imitate well, but they don't innovate. They do innovate. That said, uh, I don't think that uh, th they have the complete ecosystem that exists here um, with respect to um, the R&D side, the development, the private sector development side, the capital uh, uh, side and everything else. Um, but what they do have is very large amounts of government resources are willing to plow into what they believe to be the kind of commanding heights of the new technology world. So AI, but also um, autonomy, uh, genetic editing, quantum computing, and some other areas like that. Um, it, you know, it, it's always hard for any government to not waste a lot of money when it's trying to, you know, determine how to place bets, but the kind of bets that they're placing are very significant. And um, they've also appropriated a very large amount of intellectual property um, through uh, cyber theft and things like that. So when you add all this together, I think what you what it adds up to is the United States has everything necessary to compete very effectively against China in the technology sphere, as well as the other spheres. But we do have to you know, do work at home to make ourselves more innovative. And if you look, for example, at Capitol Hill, to the degree to which there's anything other than dysfunction. Uh, you, you see Republicans and Democrats coming together behind legislation that would be specifically designed not to try to hold China down, but to try to make America more innovative, more uh, economically um, dynamic, and, and have a more of a cutting edge on, on technology issues, specifically for this purpose, so that we don't fall behind China. 
And also, you know, we're so entwined with China. So during the pandemic, when a lot of our personal protective equipment was sourced from China and a lot of our goods are sourced from China, it seems a very interesting balance between working cooperatively, competing at the same time, and our values are very different as countries. So, Yeah, and this is the biggest difference between the Cold War uh, and now. And so a lot of people have argued that given the frostiness of relations between the United States and China, that we're in a new Cold War. And if you mean by Cold War, you know, tensions and competition without hot war, sure. But but there's a, uh, some major differences between now and, and the Cold War uh, back in the day. One is that there were very defined blocks. There was, you know, NATO and and the Western bloc and Western allies, and then there was the Soviet bloc, and and you were sort of in one camp or the other. And there were some non-aligned countries or countries that sort of were in the middle, and they were the the sort of grounds for competition between the blocks. But the other very significant one is there just wasn't much trade, uh, much economic interchange. I mean, the, between the, certainly the United States and and the Soviet Union. So, you know, we sold Pepsi, and we sold some grain to the Soviet Union. They didn't really have anything we wanted to buy. Uh, and that was about it. So it was primarily a political military competition, ideological competition, uh, you know, not one that's on economics, nor did we have that kind of interdependence. But, you know, go to your, go to Walmart or Target and see where most of that stuff there is made. And, uh, and and look at at some of our banks and where they're placing big bets in terms of their capital uh, injections today. It's in China, and so the degree of economic interdependence between the United States and China is so great that it's this uh, challenge of how do you compete with a country that has ambitions that we find uh, you know potentially um, uh, you know disruptive, if not destructive, uh, and has values that are highly illiberal, but at the same time, uh, your own our own prosperity depends to a significant degree on continuing the economic relationship with China, which is just something we've never done before. And the other thing about it is it's the case that um, in modern times, the United States has never had a great power competitor that's had more than about 44% of US GDP. And the Soviet Union, again, was a Pretty, it was, you know, it was an economic dwarf, even though it was a military giant, and uh, and you know, China, depending on how you measure it, is is at or near 100 percent of U.S. GDP, and is likely to to break through that and go. So, so the dynamics associated with how you manage uh, a competition with a with a power that you're doing all this trade with on a daily basis is it's a it's a new it's it's a new era. Can you tell us your thoughts on the state of U.S. and Taiwan relations and what you feel you're seeing deep within the national security community about how China is approaching Taiwan? And we hear a lot in the media about the fear that China will take over parts of or all of Taiwan. And I just wondered, um, is that founded, in your opinion, based on history, based on what you're seeing now? Yeah, so if you look uh, at the very recent history, in the past three or four weeks, there have been more um, Chinese military incursions into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. So not in terms of its actual territorial airspace and waters, but pretty damn close to it than ever before by, by a huge margin. Uh, they're flying... Uh, their fighter planes into that area over and over again. They're they're re, they're um, uh, training and and essentially practicing and rehearsing what a combined arms invasion of Taiwan would look like with ships and surveillance aircraft and fighter aircraft and all this other stuff, subs, everything. And so, of course, the question is, why are they doing this, right? And Xi Jinping's not telling anyone. So so you know you have to sort of surmise why they're doing this. And there's a couple different theories. I mean, some people say, well, they're practicing for the real thing. Um, uh, and you know, that if you practice long enough and you exhaust the other side long enough and it always looks like practice, then when it's not practice anymore, they're not ready, right? So that's that's one explanation. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to tell why they're doing this. I think though that, um, a conflict where the where China actually militarily tries to conquer Taiwan is not imminent, um, because I think that the Chinese leadership knows two things. One, they want reunification with Taiwan, 
through peaceful means, and two, they can't have it. Uh, you know, the, the Taiwanese are not going to agree or subject to any non-military coercion, uh, be forced to reintegrate, and particularly after they saw what happened with Hong Kong. They're just, they're, it's just not going to happen. So uh, the Chinese would like to, I think, try to assemble the various uh, array of things to show how serious they are, to show how important this is to them, to show that they're willing to use means of coercion, um, but that that's never actually going to be enough. And so then there's a real question. The real question is um, what you know the Taiwanese want, what the Americans want, is the status quo to endure forever. And the Taiwanese can have their quasi-independent status and their own democracy and everything. Uh, and the Chinese can claim that, that Taiwan is a renegade province that there's, is going to come back one day. But everybody just kind of goes on with their lives. The question is whether that's ultimately going to be enough for Xi Jinping, barring some trigger. You know, if the Taiwanese declared independence tomorrow, I think you would get a military move on Taiwan. But they're not going to do that. So... The question is, is there some Rubicon uh, uh, that that gets crossed in the mind of the Chinese leadership where they say the status quo just can't obtain anymore? We, we, we have to do something more dramatic than anything we've ever done, including a military way. Um, and, and that is just pure speculation about where they are. I don't think that they're close to it, but there are other people who believe that, you know, the clock's ticking and, you know, this is a several years out kind of thing. And so we're going to just have to see. Um, another major foreign policy challenge that's probably on the foremost of many of our minds is the withdrawal from with, from Afghanistan. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, um, what are the security challenges we now face as a result of that withdrawal? I think there was a recent U.S. Senate hearing where there was a projection of the Islamic State possibly being ready to have capability of being ready to attack Um other countries between six to 12 months from now. Yeah. So maybe you could speak a bit about that threat and that risk. Yeah. So uh, last week I was in um, Doha and Tashkent. Um, Uzbekistan is not as cool as this place, by the way. So <laughs> it's cool, I guess, but um, not as cool. Uh, my first international trip since the, the, the pandemic. Um, but to talk specifically Afghanistan, uh, because uh, amazingly now in uh, Little Gutter uh, <laughs> in Doha, the, the Gutteries are running the airport in Kabul. They have the Gutter Air is flying the flights in and out of Afghanistan. They've got very close ties with the Taliban. Their embassy is open in Kabul, and uh, and all the all the foreign embassies that were. Uh, including the U.S. Embassy, which we're in Kabul, have relocated to Doha, and now the Taliban comes out there, and that's kind of where stuff happens. Um, some other interesting things are going on there as well. So al Udeed Air Base, which is um, the U.S. Air Base in, in Qatar, um, received almost 70,000 uh, Afghan refugees that were in the evacuation that were transferred there by far the most of any other uh, country or any other place, and then went on to you know third countries, including the United States. And, and the counterterrorism mission, now that we no longer have bases in Afghanistan and we have no bases in Central Asia, are all being conducted from, from there, So, which is pretty far away. So you fly all the way up there and look around and then fly back and things like that. Um, and then in Tashkent, and, you know, Uzbekistan has a border with Afghanistan. And so they're trying to figure out, OK, what does this mean now that, you know, the Taliban the Taliban is in charge of a country of 30 million people. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think largely speaking, uh, I mean, I, I thought that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a mistake. Uh, most people disagree with me even today, even seeing what the repercussions are, th thinking that it was, um, you know, Afghanistan was a marginal area and that we shouldn't have been there anymore and things like that. And I understand the argument, although I disagree with it. The problem is that um, if Afghanistan was like Vietnam, where you get out of a long grinding and ultimately unsuccessful war, you go home and that it may be a humanitarian disaster, but, you know, it's a tragedy and you say, OK, it is what it is. That'd be one thing. But it's a homeland security threat. Uh, and, and Vietnam and some of these other places were not. And so, for example, when the Taliban uh, did their march to Kabul, there's a prison uh, at Bagram Air Force Base or Bagram Air Base, um, the Politarki prison that had 
several thousand um, Al Qaeda and ISIS uh, fighters that were in prison there, and they just broke the whole thing open. In fact, the guy who did the suicide bombing outside of the uh, airport and killed those American service people was in that prison and had been released. Uh, now, the Taliban and ISIS are enemies, um, but you know, in order to keep a handle on ISIS, if we're not going to do it, you got to kind of hope the Taliban is able to conduct <laughs> its own counterterrorism, its own counter ISIS operations. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't put a huge amount of trust in the Taliban's ability to do anything other than be insurgents. Um, and then on Al Qaeda, they've never broken with Al Qaeda for 20 years. They still um, refuse to break with Al Qaeda. There's been intermarriage among the families and things like that. And so, they, I mean, they, they're fairly supportive of Al Qaeda. So, the, what you're describing is the projection that uh, some Pentagon officials made this week. One was that it would take ISIS in Afghanistan, ISIS K, as they call it, um, between six and 12 months to be able to have the capability to launch attacks on uh, countries outside Afghanistan, and that it would take Al Qaeda one to two years to have that same ability. Well, the whole reason we went to Afghanistan is, is that no one would have that ability because last time groups there had that ability, they decided we were a pretty good target and we don't want that to happen again. Um, now we're very constrained in what we can do about it because we obviously have no partner on the ground. Taliban's not going to partner with us. We have no bases on the ground. We have no intelligence on the ground and the, cl and, and also nothing in Central Asia. So the closest we are is down in the Gulf, which is like seven flight hours away. So it's a pretty challenging situation just from a, a Homeland Security sort of counterterrorism um, point of view. Now, a bunch of people will say, well, okay, but that doesn't make it all that much different than the terrorist problem in Yemen or Libya or Syria or Iraq or anything like that. Um, I think it, I think it is different. Um, but I, we will see over the coming six months to a year, how severe that threat is and what, what our options are for dealing with it. Um, also, I thought we would talk a bit about the state of our relationships with allies mm -hmm. as it relates to other countries. And we've been seeing a lot of news about the new defense alliance between the US, UK and Australia and how that caused a rift with one of our oldest allies, which is France. And they even withdrew one of their ambassadors. I think that ambassador is back now, yeah. but that, that was a problem. And they're one of our oldest allies. So um, maybe you could speak a bit about that defense alliance and also about the general state of our relationships with allies. Yeah, so this uh, new grouping is Australia, UK, US, AUKUS, as, as they call it, um, was actually cooked up by the um, person who until January was the chair of the board of, of the Center for New American Security. Um, and I think it was, uh, it, it was a great step uh, including uh, on the, the, there's a deal to share submarine propulsion technology, which is a little esoteric, but actually means a big, it's big in terms of the Indo-Pacific, which is sort of maritime domain where, you know, nuclear propelled subs is, is an important capability to have and, and, and all of this. Um, so it was a great thing with one huge exception, which is the French went absolutely the, the French, there, there's a reason why the French word peak has never been translated into English. And, and, and they demonstrated, uh, you know, their, their peak. And I, and I think there were two things going on. One is they were genuinely taken by surprise. This $80 billion subcontract, the Australians had reaffirmed in writing two weeks before the announcement that they were canceling it and going with, you know, the Americans that's, you can understand peak at that. Um, the other is that, uh, you know, they've got an election coming up and not that long from now. And if uh, Emmanuel Macron didn't have his government screaming bloody murder about this, then he'd be outflanked by, you know, Marine Le Pen saying, you know, you're not standing up for the French ship building industry and defense industry. So there's sort of a political incentive to make even more out of this. Um, but, uh, you know, but I think it, it certainly could have been handled by the administration better, particularly an administration that prides itself on how much it values allies and how transatlantic it is and how much it loves NATO and all these other kinds of things. But there is something that I think is uh, important. It's an important reflection on, on this uh, because expectations, particularly in Europe, of how different nice guy Joe Biden was going to be as opposed to mean guy Donald Trump were just unrealistic. I mean, America is still America when it comes to deal with, dealing with allies. So you don't see 
Biden saying what Trump used to say, which is that, you know, allies are terrible and they don't care their burden and they get rich under our protection and the EU was, you know, established to screw America and all so all that, all that's gone. Right. But in the European mind, consultations, whether it's consultations on AUKUS or consultations where we should get out of Afghanistan should be, well, America's got this decision to make and can't quite decide and goes to Europe and sort of ask for their, you know, views. And then they, they provide those very considered views. And then America makes a decision that it would otherwise not have made, with, but for the European input. And basically what Americans tend to do on consultations is let our allies know shortly before the press release is coming out about a decision they've already made. And, and that's not a Biden thing. That's just an American thing. And it's always annoying and irritating to our allies, but it's just an American thing. And so what you see in the Biden administration, and again, AUKUS is a little bit different, but is basically a reversion of that mean of dealing with the allies. So you don't get the sort of Trump, you know, you're all screwing us and we hate you all. But, but we haven't become, you know, Luxembourg in dealing with allies, right? We're still the dominant player and sort of act like that, even though the expectations of what nice guy Joe Biden was going to be like, I think, were, were unrealistic on the European side. Well, I think um, they seem to have taken their moment to, you know, reconcile what's happened. And they did, I think, reinstate their ambassador. And hopefully that relationship is on the mend. Yeah, and, and I think the administration thought that the French were going to be mad at the Australians. <laughs> so, uh, and and that, you know, hey, you know, they're, they were going to have to deal with that. And then, and and so, you know, when the when the French seemed uh, as mad, if not more, at the Americans and the Australians, I think the administration was like, oh, shit. Like, you know, now, now uh, we didn't quite realize this was going to go this way. Now, what do we do about this? And they've tried to find ways to be inclusive about the French and, and, and things like that. So. Did they withdraw their ambassador from Australia too? They did, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 we didn't hear yeah. about that part. But but they didn't withdraw their ambassador from, from the United Kingdom, which is interesting. And this was interpreted as like a double slight at the UK because like saying that the, the French saying, <laughs> you're so unimportant <laughs> that we're not even going to bother to withdraw our ambassador just across the English Channel. So, you know, anyway, again... Très français, as they say, yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's shift our focus a bit to go. We went around the world, and I thought we'd talk a little bit more about everything related to the United States. So let's just talk about the pandemic and how you feel national security has been impacted by this pandemic. Um, well, it, it's it's interesting because you know we talked at the beginning. I've spent my whole career doing foreign policy, national security. And, you know, pandemics were always something that was like a more of a theoretical problem or something, you know, that would flare up, but then somebody would attack, would sort of attack it, Ebola or, or SARS or uh, avian influenza, you know, all these things that kind of bubbled up and, and they never really kind of took flight either because they petered out on their own or because there was sort of concerted um, international um, responses to them. And, and, you know, a pandemic like the one that we're in right now should have theoretically been the textbook case of something that would bring all the countries together, including the U.S. and China, by the way, right? This is like an asteroid headed at the Earth, right? No country has an interest in coronavirus spreading. Everyone had an interest in containing it. Um, you know, it, its continued existence in any country ultimately is a threat to all yeah, you didn't see any international cooperation. It was every country for itself, especially at the beginning. To this day, there's no U.S.-China cooperation on any aspect of coronavirus. And in fact, it's become a vector, one more vector for competition between the U.S. and China. Um, because, you know, where did it start and whose vaccines are, are going to be, uh, you know, uh, go around the world and, and all this other kind of stuff. And then even within Europe, you know, within a common market, you had countries closing their borders to each other and and preventing the export of PPE to each other and things like that. So it was really striking how in a crisis like this, something that should have at least theoretically spurred all this international cooperation actually led all these countries to take care of their own first, even at the expense of others. And to this day, um, you know, when you travel abroad or you talk to a lot of foreign officials, it's almost unfathomable to them 
that the United States would preserve, you know, all these millions of doses of vaccine on the off chance that, you know, Americans will get over their vaccine hesitancy and want to take them when there would be people lining up in other countries to take them, but yet they have no access to them. But that's kind of the way this has worked out in terms of foreign policy and national security since this whole thing has begun. Um, and it, you know, it, it tells you something about the scope, I think, of international cooperation and things like that. I mean, one is that some of these sort of transnational issues non-proliferation or something. If they don't have kind of domestic resonance, it's actually much easier to get countries to get their experts around and figure out ways to deal with it. Other ones that do have domestic resonance like pandemic or climate change, which infects jobs and all and all this other stuff is actually much harder to break out of the, you know, every country for itself, even though intellectually everyone knows that this is a global problem, not a national one, and that only through concerted action can you actually do something about it. Um, so that's been a bit of a, of a you know, a, 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 I guess a head scratcher in all of this. I mean, the other thing is that there was some talk at the beginning of the pandemic that, you know, national security policymakers would sort of realize, well, uh, you know, our biggest threat is not China or Russia or Iran or North Korea or any of these kind of nation state based threats and challenges. It's all the, the transnational stuff. It's pandemics and, and, uh, and climate change and, and, and things like that. But it, what's actually happened is that it, it has not been the case that one is substituted for the other. It's just added to it. So now the plate of the national security policymaker is not coronavirus instead of China or climate change instead of Russia. It's coronavirus and China Russia and pand and, and and you know all this, and so it's actually increased the kind of um, uh, set of national security challenges that uh, the policymakers are trying to deal with on a day to day basis. Well, I'm going to ask another question, and then we'll open it up to everyone here. Um, and my question, lastly, is. Of all of the issues that are out there, what is the issue that we're not paying enough attention to that is not in the media that we are just really not attending to in the way that we should? Well, it's always easy to, uh, in this field, to sort of scare yourself. So, uh, but, you know, why stop now? So, um, you know, if, if you want to think about a low probability, high consequence uh, problem, there's probably nothing better than the implications of a war between India and Pakistan. Um, in 2008, there was an attack on the uh, in Mumbai, a, a terrorist attack that originated in Pakistan. The Indian Prime Minister Mahmoud Singh at the time decided not to retaliate militarily, um, and and he didn't, and 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 cooler heads prevailed. Um, but he could have, and Prime Minister Modi has made absolutely clear that if something like that happened now, uh, that he would respond militarily. Um, and once that happens, you're down a path that could stop, but it might not. Um, you know, again, this is in the realm of scaring ourselves, but, you know, the uh, both are nuclear armed countries. Um, Pakistan has more nuclear weapons than India, including battlefield nukes. Reportedly, the authority to use those battlefield nukes are in the hands of the battlefield commanders rather than back in Islamabad, the way all other countries have this sort of chain of command. Um, and they have a conventional inferiority. So if India moved across the border or something, they would have little, the battlefield commanders would seem to have little choice but to use these things to stop them. You add into that the withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan, which is going to help to recreate Afghanistan as this commons for competition between India and Pakistan because Pakistan is convinced that it's surrounded by India or that it could be surrounded by India. Uh, India looks at, at, at Afghanistan and doesn't want to see it dominated by Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now this doesn't, you know, it doesn't flare up until it does. And every now and then something will happen and it does flare up. And actually the U.S., this happened in the Trump administration, has done a very good, very quiet job of reaching out to both sides and saying, okay, you look, you know, you guys, let, let's let cooler heads prevail and things like that. Um, but if there was one thing from a national security foreign policy standpoint 
um, that I think, you know, is, is a particular flashpoint, it would be India, Pakistan. Thank you for that. So I'm gonna open it up to people in the audience. You in the back. Thank you very much. This has been incredible tonight and I feel privileged to be here. So you talk about the obvious things with, you know, India and Pakistan and China. Where do you see the civil challenges that are happening to humanity in like the Sudan and Syria? Where would you place that on your radar? Yeah, so um, in a couple different places. So Sudan, uh, there was just a coup in Sudan, which is, I mean, more than anything, it's it's a heartbreaking humanitarian sort of development there. Um, you know, Su Sudan was uh, an autocracy under Omar Bashir for years and years and years. It was a state sponsor of terrorism. Osama bin Laden lived there in the 1990s. Uh, for very good reasons, it was completely in the, the doghouse of American foreign policy. Uh, there was a genocide or a near genocide in the Darfur region, uh, you know, about a decade plus ago and things like that. Uh, and then suddenly there were these protests on the streets of Khartoum and Omar Bashir is gone and they look like, of all places in the world, Sudan's emerging as the world's newest democracy until, what, 72 hours or so ago when the military stepped in and said they're taking over uh, again and and they're going to be in control. And I believe the prime minister is under arrest or house arrest or something like that. Um, that's the kind of thing that is unlikely to, you know, affect daily life in the United States, but it certainly is, you know, a heartbreaking setback for the cause of democracy. Um, it, particularly at a time where if you look at the general trend in the world, um, Freedom House is a non-governmental organization and they, they sort of do a report every year on the state of democracy or the state of freedom in the world. 14 straight years, the number of democracies in the world has been fewer than the year before it. It's been in a 14 year slide after having been on a pretty relentless expansion up until that point. And so you, what you see is both the number of democracies contracting and then the quality of democracy within the existing democracies becoming not as robust as it used to be. So you see these sort of disquieting things. I mean, Syria has been beyond heartbreaking for a very long time and it hasn't only been an unbelievably um, tragic and sort of brutal uh, war there uh, at the hands of the Assad regime, um, but it's also been a prime national security threat. I mean, the the you know, wh wh which in a way, I think, I hope that this is not the movie we're going to watch in Afghanistan because in 2011, we decided that the war in Iraq was over uh, and that there were no threats there anymore. And you know, Al Qaeda in our, AQI, Al Qaeda in Iraq was defeated in quotation marks. We, we withdrew our troops, um, and then within a couple of years, um, ISIS, which was the new name of al-Qaeda in Iraq, was in the process of forming the biggest terrorist sanctuary in history. I mean, geographically, the size of the United Kingdom, upwards of 70,000 foreign fighters flocked there, and it took a five-year U.S.-led military campaign to eliminate that physical uh, terrorist sanctuary. And, you know, to this day, the United States still has troops back in Iraq and in Syria. Um, and of course, the refugee flow into Europe completely destabilized European politics and helped give rise to this populist nationalism on the right, the sort of anti-immigrant, anti-refugee uh, stuff in, in Europe. So, um, you know, w however you want to look at it from a security threat, from a political threat, from a humanitarian point of view, just from a a human point of view of watching this entire population be displaced. Um, Syria has been tragic. I will say though, having just been in the Middle East last week, the process of Assad being reintegrated into the region first, and then I think into sort of global politics, that has already begun. Uh, you know, I, the countries around the region, he's starting to get invited to regional meetings again. He's being treated, including by countries that were absolutely focused on getting him out in, in Syria as the president of, of Syria. This is, the, uh, people believe they're sort of just stating the obvious that, that ultimately it's not completely done, but he won the war. Uh, and you know that he will he will remain uh, the president of Syria, which, when you step back from it, is a pretty terrible thing. But you know, is probably probably accurate. Thank you. Oh, 
over here. Hi, this is the mic. Um, so as we increasingly move into a multipolar world, and we've kind of touched on revisionist regimes in China and um, Russia and others and whatnot, what do you see the lasting impacts and kind of realignment of American national security values and priorities? Um, that's a great question. The uh, one, I think we're already in a multipolar world. So yeah, no, I mean, I th that's a contested thing, but, but I think we're, I think we're already there. I think China's already a superpower and, and, and all of this and, um, and, you know, Russia is, is a smaller pole, but one, and, and even the Europeans, particularly after the UK has exited from the European union. And, uh, you know, there's some, I mean, they, there's still American allies, but there's, you know, some ambivalence about whether they should have, you know, this strategic ambiguity and, I'm sorry, strategic autonomy and sort of be more independent from the United States and everything else and have their own kind of identity. So anyway, I think we're in this multipolar world. Um, what you're seeing is a redefinition of American foreign policy and national security priorities um, to focus much more on the Indo-Pacific as a region, as opposed to you know, until recent years, the conventional wisdom, whether there's three strategic regions of the world, there's Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, the United States needs to be present in all of them, has acute interest in all of them, um, ends up, you know, conducting military operations in, in at least the Middle East, um, and so forth. And those assumptions are falling away with respect to the Middle East, which has to do with, um, with you know greater energy independence in the United States, the the the, the lesser sensitivity of of uh, global oil prices to geopolitical events in the Middle East, and a general exhaustion with what are seen to be long grinding, mostly unsuccessful wars in the Greater Middle East. So, um, and then you know Europe, I think, is seen as something that's sort of in a steady state kind of thing where. You know, Russia is a threat, but it's a threat mostly to our democracies through cyber means. I mean, the, yes, they could theoretically, you know, roll into Europe with tank columns, but the chances of that are pretty damn low. So you have to be prepared for it, but it's not it's not likely. Uh, but but the real challenge is China and the real theater of operations, so to speak, for that challenge is in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I personally think that that way overdoes it because I think the United States is I'm, I'm supposed to uh, actually be writing a little article for foreign affairs um, about this, trying to argue that the United States is still a global power. And if you look at what actually matters to Americans, uh, it's not just China, it's stuff, for example, in our own hemisphere. And if you look at all the money, for example, that we put into um, uh, trying to get one over on China's you know, one belt, one road infrastructure plan, it's a lot and it's way more than we've put into you know, the countries in our own hemisphere, including ones that send immigrants north of the border, right? So like just from a, what, affects daily life in America, what Americans care about, like, is that exactly the right way to do it? Eh, I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Even, you know, this idea of ending forever wars and getting out of countries and things in the Middle East so we can focus more on China has a certain surface logic to it. But when the repercussions of those kinds of withdrawals make matters worse rather than better, then we end up going back and getting involved in a bigger way than we would have if we had stayed in the first place. So um, I, I don't think we can dodge the fact that the U.S. has sort of global interests and needs to have some um, fairly high level of engagement and probably presence in multiple areas of the world. Uh, but that's not the dominant sort of mood in Washington, which is, you know, the top three priorities are China, 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 and the top three priority regions are, you know, Asia, Asia, Asia. Oh, I should, I should be letting you call on people. I don't, I don't mean to be bossy here or anything like that. Well, thank, thank you so much for the presentation. And I'd like to get back to the question around China and technology leadership and just see if you have any commentary or thoughts. It strikes me as we have uh, in China a centralized authoritarian, directed, focused, prioritized set of goals, as you were mentioning earlier. And I don't hear anything about like that in, in the U.S. In fact, if there's any discussion of technology innovation, it's usually either neutral or negative in the, in the press or, the, or, or, you know, uh, just kind of the ether. And is it 
that the government doesn't perceive it's the government's role to advocate for technology leadership, or is there just something happening that's not obvious? I mean, if you look at the, you know, the innovations that have occurred in automotive or space or vaccine technology, it, it just doesn't seem like it's they're celebrated in the U.S. as as uh, as much as perhaps in China. Yeah, you see, um, you see a lot of things moving in the direction of what you're describing. Um, so for example, there's a bill that is likely to pass the U.S. Congress that would allocate $50 billion towards semiconductor production in the United States, both R&D and then essentially direct support to the semiconductor industry with the idea that the United States would be less dependent on semiconductor production in places like Taiwan and South Korea, um, and that it would you know, be able to have the a, a cutting edge temi, uh, semiconductor fabrication inside the United States. That's classic industrial policy stuff, which China is doing, the Europeans have done, the Japanese have done, but the United States has always had a very ambivalent role uh, or ambivalent um, relationship with, with the government sort of trying to pick winners and losers, either in industries or individual companies and, and how to dole out you know, taxpayer funds to support one technology over another or one industry over another. Um, you know, this is different than I, I think sort of traditional industrial policy in the sense that, you know, back in like the 1980s, actually semiconductors and autos were the two big things. Everybody thought the Japanese were getting all this government support. There's no way American firms could compete. Therefore, you know, these were the industries of the future. And so, you know, you had to have an industrial policy to support that or, you know, uh, everybody was going to be, you know, speaking Japanese and the whole thing. And then of course that didn't happen and that sort of petered out. This is a little bit different because people are talking about doing this on national security grounds, on, on in industries that have some critical national security role. So not because we think there's gonna be a greater return on American made semiconductors and there is gonna be on Chinese made or, or Taiwanese made or something like that. And therefore we wanna get that economic prosperity here, but rather if, from a national security point of view, is it, is it okay for us to be dependent uh, on semiconductor production in parts of the world where events could interrupt that and it would have you know, potentially a uh, dramatic effect on our economy and, and other things like that. So you see a lot of talk now on essentially um, what you know, the US government should do and at what levels of, of investment or, or support to various uh, technologies and so forth. I gotta say all of that makes me, I don't know, maybe my like inner moderate Republican comes out because like, you know, which there's not much space for in Washington or anywhere else these days. But anyway, like, you know, the, 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 the but it, it makes me, it makes me somewhat uneasy because I'm just not convinced that the U S government, the people who work in the U S government know as well as the market where to allocate funds. Um, if there's real market failure and, you know, on national security grounds, you want to do it. Okay. But even then, we could all get together and pool 50 billion of taxpayer dollars and give it out, or you could find other incentives in order to do those kinds of things. And I think we're looking at these other incentives uh, make a lot of sense, but there's also this sort of reactiveness to China. Like China's got this list of five technology wants to dominate. So, you know, where the hell's our list? You know, the, the Chinese government is putting hundreds of billions of dollars into its tech industries to, you know, conquer the world. Well, where's our hundreds of billions of dollars? You know, the Chinese have got this huge, uh, you know, digital Silk Road tech infrastructure plan to wire, you know, where's our plan and stuff like that. And I'm not convinced that the way to beat or compete effectively with China on tech or any other grounds is to out China China, as opposed to double down on the things that makes America strongest which is very different and, and it, it's much more market-based. It has to do with our sort of integrated ecosystem of, you know, capital, innovative, uh, you know, startup culture, innovative economy, uh, you know, it, frankly, immigration that allows people to come and contribute their talents here, no matter where they were born and stay as long as they want, you know, things like that, none of which China can match. Um, and I, I just worry a little bit if this is all about how many, taxpayer dollars we can mobilize and throw at particular technologies or industries, we will wake up uh, and it'll be a little bit like, you know, the 1980s where we say, well, where'd all that go? So, but again, that's a minority view on Washington, all the momentum is behind those things. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I have a question about human talent. Yeah. Um, so you talked a bit about how at one point everybody was studying Japanese. Uh, you've talked about increasing like H1, H1B uh, visas, because we need more talent. 
in terms of human talent and security and developing that talent across American colleges, Amer American education. And to your point about like China being a priority, uh, recently my daughter who's studying Mandarin said, oh, yeah, the State Department has prioritized China, which I thought was interesting for her to comment on, but she was clearly aware of it. So could you talk about human talent? What's America doing in terms of developing human talent internally to be able to meet the needs to compete in terms of security? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, th there's needs across a whole variety of fronts. So there's the sort of regional needs like, you know, we need people who understand China and, uh, and speak Chinese and have lived there uh, or go to live there and, and all of this stuff. Um, there is a little bit of the, um, you know, the third grade soccer team following the ball around the field because now I'm old enough to remember when everybody was learning Arabic uh, because we were in a global war on terror. We we're going to have a global insurgency. And this was a multi-generational fight that was going to endure forever. And we had to understand radical Islam. And that was like the number one thing. And now everybody's like, wow, we study Arabic. I mean, like, what is that the play? Is that the Middle East? Like, you know, aren't we trying to get out of there? It's China, China, China. Well, of course, again, it's the Middle East and China, right? So you have priorities, but it doesn't eliminate the need for some of these these other things. Or, or you go back long enough. I mean, actually, I remember after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, uh, our intelligence agencies suddenly had to start focusing on Russia again because. I, even before that, uh, I remember at one point uh, when I was working in the government, I went over to meet uh, someone who's one of the intelligence agencies, and he was the head of the counter radicalization unit, or he was studying Islamic radicalization. He had his PhD in Soviet studies, and he'd been repurposed to, you know, study this. And so then, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, they took those people and put them back on the Russia account because they suddenly were like, "Oh, we don't know if Russia is doing." So there's a certain balance among all of these things, um, among some of these key areas, uh, and and so there's a huge amount of resources and attention going into how do we sort of build up our China um, sort of knowledge and and capability, which is good really one of the areas and you see a lot of work being done in this but just there's a long way to go is on technological fluency um and particularly not just technological fluency but an understanding of how the private sector operates because if you're talking about you know u.s china competition u.s russia competition whatever i mean technology is increasingly the sort of vector through which a lot of this competition is taking place both on the defense side and on the economic side and therefore on the geopolitical side. And you have people in the US government, for example, like you know, the National Security Agency has tech wizards that would blow your mind. I mean, world-class, um, but, but people that come from the tech world into government or in government and are in the tech world, not just in the Washington offices, but actually you know, out here where business decisions are being made, linking those two things in a way that would help uh, policymakers think through uh, what is the role of the U.S. technology private sector in all of this, um, which is always really going to be primarily private in, in contrast to some other countries. Um, that That's an area where there's a huge amount of work to be done in terms of the human capital. And then and then attracting those people and then keeping them in government for sufficiently long time so they can build up that expertise. So that's, that's one area. Again, you see a bunch of work being done to try to do that, um, pilot projects here and there, including out here. But there's a long way to go on on the tech front. Yes, ma'am. So where do you see in Greenfield as we look on the new landscape? Um, where do you put Israel? And especially given your gravitas in national security, where would you position them? Um, Israel, uh, well, I guess I hesitate just because it, there's various dimensions to, to the question, right? So um, the biggest issue in terms of U.S. foreign policy and Israel right now has been the declining support in the Democratic Party for Israel, including on Capitol Hill. So in this last war with Gaza, um, with Hamas in, in Gaza, uh, Joe, uh, Joe Lieberman, <laughs> Joe Biden, um, was actually, he, he had probably the most sort of pro-Israel approach 
um, and you on the Democratic side, I mean, he's the president, but but the, the the Congress was more sort of Israel skeptic. And five years ago, if you told anybody that the Congress would be less instinctively supportive of Israel than the executive branch, nobody would believe it. I mean, it just that's not how things worked. Um, but but things have changed, particularly on the Democratic side. And I think some of this has to do with Netanyahu and and, and other things like that. Um, but that is a dynamic uh, in terms of the, the the support for Israel. Now that said, the, I mean the, the, there's opportunities with Israel, um, including opportunities the U.S. has led on that didn't exist before either. So in the Trump administration, you know, they brokered this normalization deal between Israel and the UAE, between uh, Israel and Bahrain, between Israel and Sudan, between Israel and Morocco, between Israel and Kosovo. I mean, again, if you go back not that many years, the idea that Arab countries would be normalizing ties with Israel and sending, you know, plane loads of people to Tel Aviv to try to invest in their tech sector and inviting them to come over and things. It, it was unthinkable, but that's where we are now. And I think the current administration is less, it's just less deal makey <laughs> the way the Trump one was. So it's, it's less willing to haggle to get those deals done. And of course, you know, the next round of countries is going to be harder to get in than the first round. Um, but that's a major opportunity. Uh, to at long last try to bring some normalization of Israel's role in the Middle East and diffuse a source of what has been tension for a very, very long time period of time. Um, and so that, that's, dram that's dramatically new just in the past, you know, three, four years. And I think it's something that the current administration does want to build on. But, you know, this, this Israel skepticism, particularly on the Democratic side, is, is a real phenomenon. Well, I'm going to, oh. um, sadly, I think it's, Almost time. If you can make it super quick, I'll just answer yes great. or no. Even if it's not a yes or <laughs> even if it's not a yes or no question, I'll just say <laughs> yes or three ahead. or something like that. So, okay. thanks. I'll do my best. Um, do you see the demographic uh, inverted pyramid in China um, or the um, sector bubbles as a threat to China's economic power and? Uh, either of those or other threats having um, consequences on uh, China's um, international ambitions. Yes, um, but, but, I, but I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly tell you why. So, so the, the fact that China had a one child policy, which it's very belatedly woke up and said, oh my God, this means that as the population gets older, you have a, a greater set of, of people uh, who need to be supported by a smaller number of workers. That's a real demographic challenge. They're now in trying to encourage families to have more than one child. It's not really working. It's not, it's not happening. Um, and so the, the demographic, as China gets older, um, it, it's going to cross over to this point where, you know, it just has an increasingly large number of people that are not in the workforce that need to be cared for by the people who are in the workforce. That's a real challenge. I mean, already, if you look at, for example, India is seeing a major demographic dividend right now. So the average age of an Indian is 24. The average age of, uh, of uh, a Chinese is 34. Actually, the average age of a Japanese is 44. So it tells you sort of where these countries lie and tells you a little bit of the story of their economy and where they're going, what they're trying to deal with. I mean, already growth rates have come down in China from, you know, it's never completely clear exactly what they are anyway, because the numbers you can't really trust, but 10-ish percent down to way below 10 percent and no one project, projecting at any point that they're going to get back up into that and then you lay on to that some of the problems they've got in their financial sector not you know books of non-performing loans and things like that um the question though is like how much does that actually matter at the end of the day and i think it matters i just don't think that it matters to the point where what happens to China is akin to what happened to Japan after the 1980s, where it went from, you know, oh, my God, this is the this is the next superpower to a lost decade, uh, you know, in the 1990s of economic performance uh, and then followed by essentially a subsequent lost decades of economic performance that's, that made people see Japan in a very different light. Now, part of the reason is because China's 
well, it's just a lot bigger. It's it's economy now is bigger than than Japan's ever was. Obviously, its population is way bigger, and I think its ambitions are way bigger. And so, you know, even if um, its growth rates come down, they're still going to be positive. Uh, and um, and the amount of money that they want to put into the military and to you know the way they want to conduct themselves internationally, I think that the Chinese leadership has just in their heads concluded that the West day has passed, particularly America is a, is a ter in a terminal decline, that China's day has arrived and that first the region and then second, the world has to accommodate, accommodate itself to that fact. And even though that bumps up again, some of the trends that I was just talking about, I don't think it's the trends that end up making those ambitions go away. I think it's the, those ambitions that continue to carry Chinese foreign policy forward, despite the fact that it's going to have some of these economic and demographic challenges. But I could be wrong about this and everything else. So who knows? <laughs> we'll come back and talk about it again over drinks. So. Richard, you have the best temperament for someone who works in national security, <laughs> because I thought we'd have to end this talk with a big, what are you optimistic about, Richard? But you just seem like an optimistic person. So uh, what I is think the alternative? That, yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. So I'm going to end on a more lighthearted note, which is we went around the world. We talked globally. We talked about U.S.-centric issues. But now I want to talk about something very, this is the last question, on an individual basis. If we were at a dinner party, I would turn next to you and say, hey, national security expert, what do you do to protect your privacy or your personal data? And what do you do to protect your family, generally speaking, in this space? Um, always use two-factor authentication on every single one of your accounts. Um, have a password keeper so that uh, you don't just have like one, two, three, four, or password as your password or something easily guessable. Um, you know, for CNES, we've got um, CrowdStrike monitors all the traffic that goes back and forth on a pro bono basis, I should add, um, because, but uh, because they learn something from the fact that, yeah, for me, for example, every time I write an article that's like, you know, somewhat critical of China, then I get, you know, these uh, invitations, shall we say, from, uh, <laughs> from questionable <laughs> cyber actors asking me to click on things or asking me to, you know, things like that. So we, we sort of monitor all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you travel to certain places like China or Russia, you got to either leave your phones at home or bring burner phones. Uh, are those or, the only two regions where you would do that? Or would you do that when you travel to other places? There too? are other places. Um, but, you know, I, for example, I, I brought my phone with me um, this other time. But I, but we use VPNs for the, uh, if you're going to use a Wi-Fi signal or, or, you know, if you use a cell signal from far away. So there's various things, depending on what your level of sensitivity is. Um, if you're particularly sort of, juicy target for some countries because the work you do is involves them and they're curious about it, then, you know, you have to take additional steps. But, um, you know, just in terms of individuals, and I'm sure that this is true out here. I mean, I know people that have been subject to identity theft and businesses that have been subject to ransomware and things like that. So the basic cyber hygiene is, is step one in all this, and that can eliminate, you know, not all by any stretch of the imagination, but a pretty large amount of the kind of bad things that happen. I, I remember all the way back into the 2008 presidential campaign, when I was working on the McCain campaign and getting called down to the FBI. And they sort of brought me to this, this big room and it was just me on one side of the table. And it was all these FBI people on the other side of the table. I was the only one on the campaign that had my security clearances. The guy says, you know, why don't you tell us why you think you're here? And I was like, no, you called me. I don't have to tell you. And so then they said, okay, well, your, your systems have been completely penetrated by a foreign entity and they're exfiltrating all the data. They knew about Sarah Palin before I did, um, you know, every night. And uh, I said, okay, well, what can I do about it? And they said, well, you can't tell anybody it's classified. I said, okay, that's not helpful. So we negotiated a, you know, so, uh, you know, Things have come a long way um, in terms of what's possible and, and personal uh, protection of data and things. But this is the ball game. I mean, this is the whole ball game. I mean, you know, if 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 bad actors can achieve through digital means what they would otherwise have to achieve through physical or kinetic means, they will always do it because the deniability can be higher, the price can be lower, the effectiveness can be higher, things like that. So yeah, you've got to take the basic cyber hygiene to steps to protect your stuff. 
Richard, thank you so much for being here thank and giving us me, a yeah. glimpse into the national security world. Thank you to everyone who's here. And Richard's colleagues are also here in the room, so please stand up yeah. um, if you are one of Richard's colleagues. And they'll be hanging out after, so we invite you to continue the conversation. Um, they'll be hanging out for a little while. And again, welcome to the Battery. We hope to see you again. Thank you very much. And that this can be a place you come when you need to escape D.C. I like it. Thank you very <laughs> okay. much. appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.